and Ginny. Yes? You're Chantal, right? Introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Chantal, um, and I'm uh, the founding member of Adega. Uh, I was the first vice president of Adega. So I would like to talk about the subject to what I would like to uh, explain uh, so beautifully. Can you speak a little louder? Uh, um, concerning the, the participation of Avega in the creation of the, the, the fund for um, education for orphans, um, Avega um, collaborated with other survivors' organizations. One of them is uh, Ibuka. It's a called, Ibuka means remember. It's another organization that is really have been um, working very, very uh, hard and uh, advocating for, for survivors. And then it's with uh, that collaboration with other organizations that Avega was able to convince the government to set up that fund that had been uh, there for, for, for orphans so they can go to school. And as Odette said, Odette said it, it was uh, a drop in the ocean. Even now, there are kids who still need help. And um, that's why uh, the work of Avega and other survival organizations is still very uh, important. Also, um, Concerning why we started meeting in the beginning, uh, I think we didn't even plan to meet because we found ourselves in Rwanda. We, we lost our husband, we lost our, our families, we lost our parents, we lost our friends. And um, if you, you you met with someone you knew before the genocide, it was really a miracle. And we, um, Esperance and Christine, we, people who met at that time, we would meet someone and say, okay, let's let's get together. And the, the, the first month, the first month, it's just a, around maybe the end of 94. It was just let's talk about our, our stories. We didn't plan that. We felt like uh, at least there's someone I know. I feel like I'm no longer alone. And by meeting slow, we didn't even any, have any place to meet. We met under trees and met on the street, and just by mouth by mouth by mouth, women would come. And after a few weeks, because <coughs> hundred women meeting every week, which we, we've not planned, just talking, talking, talking. And after me, for a few months, in a few weeks, we said that we can have it, we can create an organization. And that's how it started. <coughs> Thank you. Um, I'm Linda Bash with the National Council for Research on Women, and I just want to thank you all. I mean, this is so moving, your work, and um, thank you for coming here. Thank you for all the work you've done, and thank you to the Gruber um, Foundation for bringing this to our attention, because I think it's so important for us to know about this. Um, I, I just had the opportunity to go to the Clinton Global Initiative, and your president was speaking there and was quite active in conversation. And I'm just wondering if you could tell us a little bit about some of the impact that you were able to have on reconstruction efforts today on a larger, maybe on a larger scale in Rwanda, that would be very helpful. Because I think to the point that um, you made, that women so often are left out of the peace building reconstruction efforts, and their voices are very important. Certainly, in terms of the um, the misery, the trauma that's been suffered, but also in terms of visions for the country going forward. Thank you. So, how is Azega involved in reconstruction today, and in the, the bigger planning for the new one? Azega uh, is uh, committed to participating in the construction of the country. Even the country belongs to everybody, to everyone. Else. So we, have, we, we are going to go to the construction of the country where Avera is helping, uh, encouraging women in fighting uh, poverty, in school uh, income creating activities or uh, livelihoods uh, where they, um, they uh, work for their own development and help their own families and uh, also 
they are uh, many are representing others in different organs, like uh, in the district council, in the parliament, in the different structures of women, where we want to, uh, to, to raise our voice in different organs. And also uh, in the health, we, we have uh, the protection of our women against uh, uh, disease like HIV AIDS and uh, also protect youth uh, regarding uh, trauma, regarding uh, AIDS, uh, <coughs> as we need them for the future of Rwanda. Uh, also, we, 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 have, we have our young uh, survivors uh, and we prepare them for the future of our country. Because uh, we as widows, we are getting old, but uh, we are doing our examples for our children and now uh, to make them strong and to be participating in the construction of the country. Well, then one question though, was about you know, involving yourself in formal structures. Mm -hmm. you know, I think that was the sense of your question. Mm -hmm. So, um, what are, you know, you said some local councils, community councils. Are, do you have members in parliament? Are they have members in parliament? Yes, we, among the 56 percent of the women uh, in the, uh, the parliament, uh, we have uh, maybe five, five widows in the parliament. Of the parliament. I, think, I think the important thing and uh, the impact of groups like Navega in Rwanda is that currently Rwanda has the highest, Rwanda parliament has the highest number of women. At least if they've done nothing at all, they have managed to convince the population that you need women in positions like parliament, in positions like district councils, local councils, to be able to take decisions that will have positive impact on the development of the nation. And I think that is really, really an important lesson. But that started with an official quota for women in parliament, didn't it? There was at first a quota for women in parliament, no? That the government decided there would be a percentage of <coughs> seats reserved for women in parliament, no? Is that, am I correct? Right. Yeah, but that was a result of the lobbying that the yeah. women's groups had done. Had done. Because in the past, you would have only men yeah. being sponsored to go into parliament. But they had done enough to impact the thinking of government mm -hmm. that we must have a certain minimum yes. of women in the And now you've exceeded that minimum. Yes, of course. Really? When I got to go, I the money. Step by step, by helping them overcome the trauma 
understanding the situation, what happened in the genocide, the meaning of what happened, and slowly, slowly, by uh, tra through trainings on trauma, through trainings on you know, the uh, rights, women rights, children rights, and through uh, a process of education, uh, we, we took a decision now to meet same country, not to collect the same mistake by another mistake, by also killing, but we, we educated our uh, members, our members of Abega and the survivors, uh, needed to understand and uh, to make a commitment for the future. It is then, uh, step by step, we, we have been strong to, to accept the situation and to go forward. But then you do commemoration work and you also do conflict resolution type of um, workshops with young people, right? Do you want to talk about that? How that is? That may not answer so. but, uh, Yeah, the way through those trainings we conduct, we invite uh, especially young people uh, to help them move on and uh, in a safe uh, movie. And uh, we talk, we have the discussions uh, with women and uh, young people. And uh, really, to, we convince them uh, through those uh, uh, discussions and training and show them where they are going. And it is there, the, they changed completely and they decided uh, to be to the country. Even the, uh, the, they are, there are uh, many problems of trauma, of loss of their families, but through counseling, uh, regular counseling, we, we move on. We move on. And also, we train our beneficiaries in the order to be uh, on the basic laws uh, where they uh, also they help the uh, fellow widows and the orphans, the community, uh, to help them understand uh, their rights and de defend their own rights in the community. For example, uh, the rights uh, regarding property and the inheritance. They know that and they, they know where to go uh, to claim for their rights. And uh, sometimes those uh, people, those women who have been trained, sometimes they orient where to go and find a, a, an answer of their problem. And they also, they accompany sometimes because the, the, the widow or orphan does not know where to go. So in the community, we have a moving of uh, support of different uh, category of people in the community where everybody feel comfortable because they are, uh, they are supported by each other, by uh, fellow widows. Do you, do you know what we could see when you help We have in Abega, because with our Objective uh, to rebuild the country uh, strongly in terms of uh, unity and reconciliation. We help everybody who needs that support yeah. in terms of uh, legal support or in terms of trauma counseling. Uh, we help everybody who needs that mm -hmm. because we can't build all the past, but we want to build. Uh, best country for the future. Yeah, and the gentleman in the front and then we'll yes, see what happens. Two questions. First, how do you overcome trauma? And the second question is, as you think about how you overcome trauma, what is the role of formal law, courts, prosecution, and what's the role of informal law and community community networks? How do, you, how do you think about the law and overcome trauma? Okay, so maybe we can ask Shantan to speak about what do you do to overcome trauma? Qu'est-ce que vous êtes en train de faire pour aider les gens à surmonter le traumatisme qu'ils ont vécu? Nous avons tout d'abord créé des espaces de travail où on rencontre les femmes 
les personnes vivent des traumatismes et ils traitent des êtres exprimés, exprimés et explorer les problèmes. Et puis, euh, nous avons essayé de former les, les personnes, euh, les animateurs du corps social, ce sont des personnes euh, qui reçoivent euh, une information, euh, qui reçoivent une euh, information de base et qui donnent, qui dispensent des conseils individuels aux personnes traumatisées. Il y a aussi la formation des cancers euh, des professionnels en traumatisme et qui donnent euh, le cancer individuel et le cancer de groupe. <laughs> so they started first by creating what they call uh, speaking spaces, community speaking spaces, where the women can get together in groups to start discussing their problems and telling their story. Then after that, the next thing they did was to train peer uh, facilitators who are trained at the community level. These are lay uh, facilitators who can do some peer counseling in groups and in And then there was the training of professionals and the real professional uh, cadres who can also get individual and group counseling. Nous avons essayé de passer les, les cancers au niveau des districts où les animateurs de soins sociaux, les personnes de l'âge, ont les six formations de base pour le transfert, euh, pour que ces conseillers puissent résoudre les problèmes que les APS ne peuvent pas So, and they placed a lot of these uh, structures at the district level so that if the problems are not able to be resolved at the community level, then they can be brought up to the next level for more, more specialized assistance to the individual question. So they also do sensitization of the entire community so that 
community understands when people have gone through the extreme suffering and the, the horrors that they've witnessed um, and are able to help in their own way in supporting the person's own healing process. So it's really a group, a community engagement in the rehabilitation of, of those who have suffered trauma. And now the second question, which is about uh, from the first question, I would like to add something. Uh, uh, it is not only the Abega who is doing that, but the entire community, uh, the government uh, uh, put in place a uh, lot of measures in, uh, in that regard, where uh, during the commemoration, uh, survivors are uh, helped by the entire community, and everybody is uh, concerned. Well, the, the second question is the role of legal proceedings, you know, in helping with healing. I mean, you know, women have gone to court. There's been the process, the gachacha process, which is a big process, a traditional course that was set up in the early 2000s to try to deal with some of the questions of culpability and guilt. And um, how has this helped women feel better? going through the gachacha, or is it, what's the outcome of all that? There have been thousands of cases. In, really, in the beginning, it was hard to understand how to to treat or to judge uh, uh, genocide in the, in, the, in the local court. But uh, through uh, discussion, and uh, we tried to convince women uh, because there were many, many, many uh, perpetrators in the prison. And uh, really, it was, if you would ask the uh, Rwanda to judge about uh, 200 years to judge those people. So, uh, for uh, uh, that reason, uh, it will, in, in 200 years, it could not be a survivor in life. Yes. So to convince them, to, to show them that it is an opportunity to, to say or to express what we, we have seen or we have heard, and um, also to be comfortable with you in your heart that you have contributed as you can when you, you were in life. So we, we, we took a time to, to discuss with the survivors about that issue, and then they, they have understood and they have committed to participate in the judgment in the, the, process, the whole process of those uh, local courts. And uh, really, it, um, those courts uh, have have reached the success as uh, you have followed uh, through media or what, uh, where uh, we have understood what we want, where we want to go. So the women were encouraged by Abega to testify, testify about their ideas. But that can also be very difficult to relive, to tell your story again in public must be, must be traumatic. You know? Yes, uh, but we, we have put in place measures to help those people, like uh, <coughs> volunteers in trauma, and they all psychologists uh, in place to accompany them in the judgment of or during the testimony of those uh, in those courts. Also, we we encouraged uh, women to accompany, even they are not uh, counselors. But also, when you, 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 you see other people behind you, you feel comfortable, you are, uh, you are confident to, to say what you want to say. So we created that, um, uh, that um, program among our beneficiaries to, to help each other and to accompany in every way there is a judgment of, in those courts. Are you comfortable with the outcomes? Yeah. Did it work? And the courts, did they produce results that satisfied? Yes, the because it helped, they, they helped uh, somehow in the process of the 
association because we 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 have to know how they kill our our relatives, how they have put our relatives, and uh, we have been able to bury them in dignity. And it is the the most important thing we did for our relatives, our husband and children, when we found the, the remains of their body and we buried them in dignity. And then it is the start of our decreasing of trauma. When someone uh, found the remains of the, 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 the bodies and we buried them, he said, oh, I'm really uh, comfortable that I found my husband and now I buried him uh, in dignity. And a lot of that information came through these, those testimonies in court where the people's remains were. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah, yes, yeah. yes, yes. It helped us to, to know the truth about the genocide, how it was planned, the who, who were uh, actors, the main actors, the planning of genocide and so on. I'm Anissa Mankey. I sit on the board of directors of an organization called Abraham's Path. And we're involved in cross-boundary conflict transformation. And my question I'd like to address to your honor. Um, what preconditions, if any, need to be in place for work like this to take hold and be successful? I think I heard so often the, the words after the genocide, after the genocide, and I don't know if that means there has to be peace first. I worry about the people of, even though it's not genocide, the people of Afghanistan, of Iraq, of now Libya and Syria and Palestine and, and Darfur, who are not in a place of after the war yet. So what preconditions need to exist before this kind of work it's not a very easy question to understand, to answer. There has been, especially since the advent of the International Criminal Court, you know the, and the work that is doing mostly in Africa, there has been a fierce debate between peace versus justice. There are many who have argued that we need peace before justice. But my position, and I think the position of most people, is that peace and justice are not mutually exclusive. You need both in order to achieve sustainable peace and development. What justice does, and I think it has been demonstrated here very clearly, is that there is, we create through, just, through the justice process, whether it's at a local level or at an international level, you want that you have both, both the Dachacha and the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. You create a record of how this came about who is responsible. You punish some of those, obviously you, cannot, you probably cannot punish everybody, but you punish some of those who are responsible for it. That way you stop collective guilt. You stop this process of a group of people being perpetually, collectively guilty of something. You create a record of who was responsible, how it came about. First, just for future generations, Second, so that we don't repeat the, uh, the same mistakes that brought them about. Now, having said that, both can go hand in hand. You can have the process of reconciliation and peace, as well as justice. For example, in Sierra Leone, where there were the massive, massive, massive atrocities committed, 10 year, 10 month old babies had their arms chopped off in this conflict. Babies who had nothing to do with anything. They chose the path of both reconciliation and justice. A special court for Sierra Leone was set up to try to do the highest responsibility for the offenses that occurred. There was also a peace and reconciliation panel set up so that people would tell their story. Through these two processes, we have a historical record of how the civil war came about, who was responsible for it. They have, some of them have been punished. Obviously, it's not everyone who has been punished. But those with the highest responsibility have been punished. 
you stop this process of collecting guilt where a whole generation will grow up thinking it is these people who are responsible for it and then you perpetuate this violence from generation to generation and you are able to have some closure which I think has been demonstrated here. Yes, law and the effect of this justice program may not be able to be seen in the short term, but in the long term, it does bring some closure to the individuals involved and it helps the nations to move on. And yes, it was because of the former Yugoslavia, Rwanda, uh, Sierra Leone, uh, Cambodia, and so on that the International Criminal Court was set up because it was felt that if after the event you set up the tribunal, first of all, it's extremely expensive. <coughs> Some of the memories would have gone, people would have died, you know, we couldn't sit. Some of the record would be missing. But if there is a permanent court in place which can deal, and unfortunately, what the ICC now is dealing with, all the cases we are dealing with are in the middle of conflicts. Every case before the ICC is in a conflict area. It doesn't that save the conflict. But at least the message is out there that if you continue to do this, there is an institution in place that can take action. And hopefully, in the long term, that will stop a lot of. And even now, in northern Uganda, where the, uh, the Lord's Resistance Army was being, <coughs> had devastated the whole of northern Uganda and displaced huge numbers of people. As soon as indictments were issued against the leaders of the group, they moved out. Now, northern Uganda is gradually coming back to people have gone bad, they started their lives. The International Criminal Court has a, a, a trust fund for victims, which tries to help victims get back their lives together. And they are engaged in programs, small micro programs to help individuals within the community begin their life, you know, economic programs, trauma counseling, all the things that have been done in Rwanda are being done in order to rebuild the society. So that even if the leaders are still in the jungles between Congo, Sudan, and the Great Lakes, the impact of those indictments have been very clear. First of all, it brought them to the peace table, but Kony insisted that unless the warrants were withdrawn, he wasn't going to sign. But he has not gone back into Uganda. And he's wreaking havoc from time to time in the jungles of Sudan, Congo, and so on. But I think he knows that his time is limited. He knows that one day, because the indictments have no expiry date. So the impact of law is not always easy to see in the short term, but in the long term. And my position is that peace and justice go together. They are not mutually exclusive. We can pursue programs for peace, reconstruction, at the same time as we pursue programs for justice to bring those who have the highest responsibility for instigating, planning these crimes to justice. Thank you, I'm Sakito Kukula Paul. I'm a professor at the New School here, and I was a member of the, uh, the advisory committee. Um, I have a comment and a question. The comment is simply to say that uh, it's wonderful to be here um, and to explain to you also that in, I think in making the selection uh, for the award, I think that uh, what really motivated many of us was to see a group that really exemplified women not as victims but as agents um, for taking uh, things forward. Um, my question is now it is uh, 17 years after the genocide. So you have a whole new generation of young people who have grown up not having experience and who have no memory of it, personal memory. So what does that mean for the country and for an organization like yours? Do, what do you discuss in terms of any changing priorities that you may have in your program, that your priorities in 
1995 must have been very different from your priorities today. So, you know, internally, when you are chatting about your priorities, what are the things that you're considering about shifting the, to pay attention more to the, uh, the new generation? Thank you for your question. Uh, uh, we are planning uh, really for the future of those young people uh, as uh, the future belongs to them. And uh, we show education uh, where we encourage them to continue to do their studies uh, in the secondary school. They are helped by the government uh, through the fund, the fund uh, called FATCH set up by the government. Also, for those who, uh, who get uh, the maximum, the, the, the max uh, required for university, they are helped. But because of the difficulties, they, um, they are living uh, uh, the whole the, the whole their life. Uh, really, they don't get enough max. This is why we have a big number of children who are staying at home after uh, completing the uh, secondary school, uh, where now they are stuck, they don't get uh, job because the uh, their studies uh, don't allow them to get job, and also they don't they, they can't go uh, to university because they they are not eligible for the max uh, they have, or be required by the, the government. Uh, was also a limited fund they have available for universities studies. So for us, we continue to encourage them and, uh, uh, to advocate for the potential uh, donation where we, we, we support a few number of children who continue to do their studies in university. Also, we encourage others to go for professional uh, studies, and vocational, yeah, training. vocational training, uh, and then after that, they go uh, for work and they can find jobs. Uh, but it is really, it remains a, a big challenge we have actually. And what about the question of the fact that these young people don't know about the genocide? They didn't live, you know, they were too young or they, you know, they were born. Or so how do you engage in that conversation about memory so that it's not forgotten and it's understood? We commemoration genocide in terms of not uh, forget what happened in the past, but we can't stay, uh, stay in the past. We want to continue to, um, to live better and find a uh, better way uh, for the future. But uh, those who, uh, children who are, who are born or were born in a, uh, after genocide or during genocide, it, was, uh, it is a big problem for them to understand it. And it is those who are very, very affected by the trauma. Uh, and um, we continue to help them uh, through those uh, sessions of uh, individual counseling and group counseling. And uh, also we emphasize on the approach of community approach when we help each other in our families. My name is Martha Diaz. I'm the director of the Hip Hop Education Center at NYU. As someone who believes in the power of hip hop to heal, to uh, empower young people, what is the role of the arts? <laughs> The role of the arts. The role of the arts. arts. You say yeah. Yeah. visual arts in, in your work. And you and you wrote the Pas seulement dans le, dans le cadre de la thérapie. 
Donc, euh, cette réalité, ce n'est pas cela de nos autres alors. Ouais. Là où on, on est on beaucoup de ces gens pour s'exprimer, quelquefois, on s'exprime en travaillant, c'est la même chose. So the, from what I understand, the main way in which art and music and so on come in is through the therapy. So they use art therapy and music therapy, and in group sessions, they use the visual arts for people to express what they've gone through. That's the main way it's, it's used with that makeup. Well, she definitely be used as a medium to engage. So you can come and talk to them yeah. after we're just come up. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, my name is Esperanza for Avega. Um, just like to add to what Odette said and to answer your question regarding the, how to prepare now our young generation that time they were young when genocide happened. So now what we are trying to, as we live here in America, Shandak, and Art, now we are focusing more on orphans of genocide who are Rest uh, fortunate, not uh, because the one thing we really need to make sure is to meet their basic needs. Because once those basic <coughs> needs not are not met, it's really hard to move on. So beside the assistance support they have from the fund to pay their their school fees. We make sure they have other their needs meet like uh, the transport fees, the school supplies. Some of them they live by themselves. Mm -hmm. They need someone to support them. You can't send a child to school when doesn't have anything to put on the table. When doesn't have somewhere to sleep, to sleep. So we have to make sure it's not really, we are trying, we are on the right direction, but at least we have to make sure we are focusing on those needs. <coughs> so we have a, a non-profit organization here, the name is called uh, Fortress, is a friend of Wanda survivors of genocide. So our main focus, and we work with Avega, so is to advocate to speak out for those orphans of truth of genocide who are in school who needs more support to go ahead and to be their support, train them there, not just to send them money, just to make to make sure they know someone cares. Because it's a very important thing too. Especially when they are in that age for those who have teenagers, you know what it means. Beside what they went through, being a teenager is another thing. So we have to make sure. Because when we see them, we start, it's easy to raise a child when they young. Anybody can raise a young child. But when it comes to teenager, that's how they are. It's very hard for them. Sometimes the society doesn't understand them. You feel like they are doing with all their bad children. They are not. So now, how, that's how we work with our vegan, so we through the social worker to raise money to look for sponsors to support those children. Not for school fees, but just meet the basic needs. <coughs> uh, I remember when we went back to Rwanda, it's going to be two years ago, we met those children. The other thing we do too is to make sure they met, they get together at least once. Mm -hmm. You know, like Christian uh, Christmas time is a big, is a positive thing in most of people. So at least they don't have their families. Mm -hmm. To get them together, to raise money, to bring them to some places, not really nice, but nice, where we can give them a retreat. They talk together, they, now they have a, a, net, a network together so they know. They don't feel like, oh, I feel myself, I lost all my parents, my splits. That they know, like, next, Next, how he, someone read the same thing. And they start to think like, no, I am not alone. Not only that, we teach them how, we try to explain, we, nobody can really explain what happened. Nobody, but we try just to say, 
then try to overcome our past by doing the right thing, by telling them we care, we do all the things, and they have each other. Now they are like families. And I remember when we went there, they were giving us testimonies how now before they go to school, they felt like they are not normal because they didn't have nice crops, they didn't have hygienic items, so they have to isolate even they were in school. But today they go to school on time. They like they have a nice cross. They don't have many, but at least they have one. They can feel like they are now like other children. Just it was the support story, but was to hear how now we are trying. We don't reach many, but that's now our focus and it's time for education, but we have to make sure they are basic needs. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So is that the last question, or can I just wrap the panel up first? That's the panel first. So I want to thank our panelists today. Uh, Odette, Chantal, and Akwa. It's amazing to realize that after ongoing, uh, undergoing something as terrible as this genocide, that the women can get together with nothing, meeting person on the side of the road, and then 15 years later, have built an institution and an organization that is such a source of support and hope, and that is acting on so many fronts, including in seeking justice, not only peace, as we heard. So I'm very impressed and I'm very inspired as I leave this today, and I'm grateful to have had the chance to do this conversation with you this morning. Patricia, now the closing words.
that, and also Vice President of Development Inga Reichenbach uh, for her diligence, for expertise, and uh, all the many things that you have done to facilitate this agreement. Taylor Krauss, uh, Voices of Rwanda, has generously provided the video clip of the moving interview that we saw earlier. And we would like to thank the First Lady of the Virgin Islands for coming. Cecile de Young has also founded the Rwanda Project, U.S. Virgin Islands. It's a 501c3, and it's raising funds for high school students in the Virgin Islands to go to Rwanda, where they can complete community service projects. They also actually sell some of the Rwanda handicrafts um, that are here today, some food work and other jewelry. Who is also here is Jeannie Redeker of WNET. And as you may know, we started with Rwanda and we're ending with Rwanda. Our first prize went to Namakile and Profound, Tracy Conway. Uh, and uh, you heard uh, Judge Kent Quenye refer to her crucial role in declaring rape as a war crime on behalf of the tribunal, which made possible so many advances in women's rights. And at that very first prize was Jeannie Redeker, who saw what was going on in Rwanda and went there and made a movie called Ladies First, which is about the enormous number of women in parliament in Rwanda. Jeannie is also working on a, a terrifically powerful project right now, which will be at Yale in a couple of weeks. And it's a PBS series, a five-part series, uh, that's going to be aired on October the 11th at 10 o'clock it's called Women, War, and Peace. It's a very dynamic presentation, really echoing some of the themes you've heard here today about women as peace builders, not victims. Women who are vital to reconstruction in post-conflict situations, as well as vital voices um, in societies. So one of the segments is also devoted to a previous women's rights laureate, um, Lema Bowie. Many of you have seen Pray the Devil Back to Hell. That will be a part of this five-part series. So we thank you also for your enormous work. And finally, I wish to thank the hardworking staff of the Gruber Foundation, Deb Wadsworth and Bernita Aiken of our St. Thomas office, Philip Front, our man on the scene. You've seen him walking around with the microphone. And most especially, the woman who is responsible for pulling everything together, always with grace and perfection, Sarah Rea. Thank you. Sarah. Thank you.